Uh, good afternoon. I'm happy to be here. I'd like to thank Hans and Gwelchen for the kind invitation again to this, uh, this lovely conference and uh, in sight. And this year I'm going to talk about a topic I haven't spoken on in quite a while. Um, this was Hans's idea and I think it was a good idea. Um, as we'll see, it's, it's a timely topic. Uh, so my topic is law, the role of a corporation and limited liability in a private law or free society. Um, I'm going to post these slides later on my website. Um, they have links and background resources, as you can see here. I have a long blog post where I, I link to a lot of the materials I'll discuss here. Um, let me start with an incident that's always struck me. Uh, Murray Rothbard recounts that he once asked Mises, Ludwig von Mises, if there was any definite criterion by which you could make a clear-cut judgment about whether a given country could be designated, you know, was it, is it essentially socialist or not, or whether it was really a spectrum or a continuum issue. Um, this was a time when there was a lot of mixed economies in the world and full-throated full socialism, so he was wondering if there was any way to just make a judgment, this country is socialist or not. So Rothbard said he was pleasantly surprised when Mises promptly replied, yes, a stock market. And Mises went on, a stock market is crucial to the existence of capitalism and private property, for it means that there's a functioning market in the exchange of private titles into the means of production. There could be no genuine private ownership of capital without a stock market, and there could be no true socialism if such a market is allowed to exist. Now, why did I start with this? Notice he said stock market. Okay, what is stock? Stock means private ownership shares in what's called a joint stock company, typically a corporation. When we think of the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, we're talking about people trading ownership shares primarily in corporations, although there are some types of uh, exceptions, some types of limited partnerships. Primarily, we're talking corporations. And as we all know, and I don't need to belabor, corporations are extremely prevalent in everyday life. We all run into them. Some of us own corporations, some of us work for corporations. Uh, we deal with corporations. We travel here on the services of corporations. So this is a very prevalent aspect of modern life, modern Western capitalist life. Uh, it is only one of several types of business arrangements. Others would include partnerships, trusts, sole proprietorships, um, the PFS is modeled after a private monarchy, which is another type of uh, organization. Um, basically, these are modes of cooperation in society. There's an economic theory, the theory of the firm, which explains why business arrangements emerge, not necessarily the form, but why people cooperate in these arrangements, why we're not all just sole individuals outsourcing to each other. Uh, there's some theory about the lower limit of the firm and the upper limit of the firm. Like Ronald Coase has discussed the role of the, uh, employment and firms in overcoming transaction costs is why people come together and they have long-term arrangements in, in the shape of a firm, such as a corporation. Uh, Murray Rothbard and others have written on possible upper limits to the firm, such as the calculation problem of socialism itself. The larger a firm gets, the harder it becomes for it to have genuine free market transfer prices for internal units, and it becomes less and less efficient, in addition to other problems, such as bureaucracy, uh, bloat, uh, nepotism, etc. So firms obviously emerge for a reason, and the corporation form, the corporate form has come to dominate the type of firm that we have uh, on the market today. Okay? Now, I want to back up because the partnership is one of the earliest forms, and Traditionally, it did not need the government to establish, just people became partners. They pooled their resources, uh, they became owners of this partnership according to how much they contributed. And originally, in the original form of partnership, um, all the partners were considered to be all equally and fully liable for all the debts of the, of the partnership. That's called joint and several liability in the common law. The reason is because of the origins of the partnership in medieval uh, Italy, when most partnerships were family-based and there was a lot of intermingling of private and public, uh, the, the business funds and the private funds, and there's this matter of family honor. You know, if, if someone is owed money, then every partner of that partnership is considered to be liable to pay off the full debt, even if the other partners are unable to. So that's where the idea emerged from uh, traditionally. 
Uh, now, there's another type of partnership that's emerged. It's called a limited partnership. In a limited partnership, not every partner is completely liable for the debts of the partnership. Only the general partners are, and there only needs to be at least one general partner. Limited partners can lose their investment if the, if the partnership goes bankrupt, but only the general partner is on the hook for all the debts if the partnership is unable to pay it off. Okay? But by the way, in a strange twist, which I'll uh, you'll become more clear later, um, a corporation can be the general partner of a partnership. So the only guy that's fully liable for a limited partnership is a corporation, which is not a human being. Um, okay, so this is the background here. So what is a corporation? A corporation, well, the word corporation from Latin means a body, right? So a corporation is a, a legal entity which is considered to have legal personality. It's established by, in today's society, uh, registering with your local state. Okay, they have a, a procedure where you, it's a mere formality, but you register, and then the state grants you corporate status, which is, we call entity status, or legal personality. So this corporation is considered to be a separate legal person under the eyes of the law. Okay, it's characterized, I don't want to get it too much into boring law, but basically the, the corporation is characterized by an Articles of Incorporation, or what some people call a charter, which is a document that the incorporators or the founders uh, established that determines the rights and duties of the owners, what the corporation's purpose is, etc. It's owned under law by shareholders, and I have owned in quotes here, and I'll explain that later why this is a, a little bit of a misleading uh, legal designation by the state. The shareholders, who are the quote owners, or the stockholders, sometimes called, they have the power to elect the initial and subsequent boards of directors. So these are the people that kind of govern the overall mission of the company. These board of directors is usually compensated. They meet quarterly or something like that. And they appoint uh, the officers, the president, the treasurer. These guys then go hire other managers and other employees, and that's how the, the company is run. The company is literally run by the officers and the managers, and to some extent, the board of directors. Other rights of shareholders would include um, the right to receive dividends if the corporation pays them. It doesn't have to pay them. It can just retain all the profits it makes. Um, and if the firm, if the corporation ever winds up, that means being dissolved, then any assets left over get distributed to the shareholders at the end. So that's basically what shareholder status means. The right to vote for a board of directors, uh, the right to get dividends, if any, and then the right to receive assets upon dissolution. You know, if you're a Google shareholder, you don't have the right to use the corporate jet, right? If you're a FedEx shareholder, you don't have the right to go jump in the FedEx truck down the street and drive it around. So it's not that type of ownership. Um, so there are three features that critics of the corporation focus on. Uh, they call these privileges. Privileges granted by the state. Entity status, which I've mentioned. Per potentially, potentially perpetual duration. The, cor the corporation doesn't have to ever cease functioning after 50 years or something like that. It could potentially live forever. And finally, limited liability for shareholders, which as we'll see is, the, is really the key topic uh, under dispute. Now, this, despite the prevalence of corporations in capitalism, it has come under uh, assault, heavy assault, uh, primarily or initially by the left. Critics like Ralph Nader in the U.S. are, are well known. Uh, he has books in 1973 and 76 uh, mounting large-scale attacks on the corporation. The basic argument is that, look, corporations are artificial creatures of the state, and they have many state privileges like limited liability. And so the government should heavily regulate them, and you can force them to give back and be socially responsible, right? If the state's giving you life, the state can condition that grant of life on whatever it wants and it should regulate it heavily. Um, these sentiments are echoed in the law and standard treatments like law professor Robert Dahl, who's argued that corporations have to be socially responsible because they exist primarily to benefit society. Uh, a quote from this professor, um, today it's absurd to regard the corporation as simply an enterprise established for the purpose, sole purpose of, al of allowing profit making. We, the citizens, give them special rights, powers, and privileges, protection and benefits. Uh, on the understanding that their activities will fulfill our purposes. So it's like these corporations, we allow them to exist only if they, uh, they give us something back. Okay, so we, they have to give back. It's, and the state echoes this theory. 
in the U.S. Chief Justice John Marshall of the U.S. Supreme Court in 1819 said in a famous phrase, a corporation is an artificial being, invisible, intangible, and existing only in contemplation of law. Uh, the conservatives are also very critical um, of, of, the, uh, of the corporation. This is Irving Kristol, the author of Neoconservatism. Um, I may have the date wrong here. This may be an updated version because he's talking about 1978. He was, I'm not going to read this whole quote here, but he basically is saying it would have been a mystery to the founding fathers and to even Adam Smith, this weird thing called the corporation. Um, he concludes the founders would have said, uh, what we've been asking for a century now, who owns this Leviathan? Who governs it? By what right according to what principles? No other institution in human history, and not even slavery, has ever been so consistently unpopular as has the large corporation with the American public. It was controversial from the outset, and it has remained controversial to this day. So the left hates corporations. The state has a love-hate relationship with corporations. And the conservatives uh, have mixed feelings about it. Even some libertarians are skeptical and critical of the corporation, including some of my friends uh, here tonight, or today. <laughs> um, there was an article in the JLS, Journal of Libertarian Studies, a, a few years ago, criticizing corporations um, because the right to free incorporation conflicts with the individualism inherent in classical liberalism, because private ownership rights are given to impersonal entities. So he's criticizing the entity theory. And second, free incorporation, free private incorporation contravenes the very basic liberal and common law principles of personal responsibility. Okay. Now, one of the key libertarian criticisms centers on the privilege, they call it, of limited liability. Now, first of all, I'm going to explain what it is, but let me just say, well, let me tell you what it is. Limited liability means the shareholder of a corporation, like the limited partner of a limited partnership, has no personal liability if the corporation has debts. That means the, the, the person to whom the corporation owes money, if the corporation doesn't have the resources to satisfy that debt, cannot pursue the shareholders um, and go after their assets. Now, he might lose the value of his shares because the corporation might be driven into bankruptcy and be worth nothing after satisfying the debts. So he can lose the value of his investment, but that's all. Okay, so it's like, uh, uh, now, so, but, but, but a lot of people confuse what limited liability is. They think that it shields corporate officers or the board members from liability, which is just not true. It, it, it only says that shareholders are, are not liable. Uh, corporate officers and the employee who performs an action like a tort that hurts someone, they're liable under the law. The directors are potentially as well, which is why there's a very widespread practice called DNO or directors and officers insurance. Uh, no one would take a job, no reputable person would take a job with a, uh, with a corporation serving on the board of directors or as president unless they can make sure the corporation has taken out a good DNO policy to protect them in case of, of, of liability. Okay. So let's go back to these three alleged privileges that the corporation enjoys and see if they are really um, uh, privileges or not because this is the criticism even by libertarians of the existence of corporations. Remember, they're the entity theory that it has separate legal personality, has perpetual duration, and has limited liability. And others have criticized corporations too for having separation of ownership and control. That is, the shareholders don't really control what happens to their money and they somehow think that's objectionable. Uh, and unaccountable CEOs, you know, CEOs just doing what they want, getting paid that's too high, and uh, they say the CEOs are getting too much money even for failing corporations and they're robbing the shareholders. So on one hand, shareholders are to blame, on one hand, they're victims. Okay. And the reason we're asking this question is, the fundamental question is, in the criticism of the corporation, especially by libertarians, is could the corporation exist in a free society, in a private law society, in a stateless society? Okay. That's the question. Are these really privileges granted by the state, or could a corporation emerge in a free society? So, the fundamental question is, is it more like something like, let's say, roads? I mean, we know roads, we think of roads as government uh, things because the government has co-opted that field. As Professor Hoppe points out in his Banking Nation States article, this is one of the state's tactics. The state comes in and co-ops and undermines and takes over different aspects of, of private life, uh, law, money, banking, uh, uh, and roads, and defense, and justice. Uh, and then, you know, people start thinking of that as an essentially state thing. Even marriage is regulated by the state. So, you know, we, everyone thinks now, 
maybe except for some of us radical people, uh, that law, justice, defense, money, banking, space exploration, marriage are all government created or heavily regulated things, um, and they can't imagine how they would exist without the state. But we all know that without the state, we would have law and justice, space exploration and marriage, and things like this, and roads. But by contrast, something like patent and copyright are clearly government-granted privileges which could not and would not exist without the state. They're purely creatures of legislation, and they undermine and undercut and contradict private property rights. So the question is, are corporations more like patent and copyright, or are they more like roads and marriage? Okay, so I'm going to make sure I have enough time to get to the most important part here that I do. So let's take entity theory first. So now this is one thing that almost everyone agrees on, that first of all, the entity, except for, except for libertarians who are in favor of the corporation like me, um, so the state, leftist, conservatives, or some conservatives, and some libertarians agree on the fundamental notion that the corporation can only exist by creation of the state and is an artificial creation of the state. Um, now they disagree on what implications this has. The left, uh, uh, the, the left thinks that it should be heavily regulated and the state follows their advice. Conservatives agree that it should be regulated but just not quite as much. So you know they're always a little bit better than the left but not much. Okay. Now the libertarians, so the conservatives, the left, and the state are all wrong on two, two ways. They're wrong that the, that the corporation can only be created as an entity, and they're wrong that it should be regulated because of this. Um, now the liber some libertarians or critics are only half right, or half wrong. They're wrong that it, it is an artificial creation of the state, but they at least think that because it's an artificial creation of the state, it should be abolished. So they would think of it more like patent and copyright, like, like I do. Okay, and then some of the left libertarians also uh, have these wild theories that you know uh, the existence of the corporation and, and the privileges granted by the state that allow it to exist um, has led to a more hierarchical world, right? More unfairness, more employment even, which is a bad thing to left libertarians. Uh, authoritarianism of the workplace and exploitation of workers by these corporations. So in their view, if we could just get rid of corporations we would have you know, this, uh, uh, a more decentralized world with smaller firms and no big giant companies and maybe less or very little employment. Everyone would be uh, self-sufficient and make deals with everyone or something. Okay, so the entity theory is not uh, a privilege. It is actually a, a huge uh, 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 detriment to the company because number one, it's used to justify regulations and also taxes. Corporations, because they're considered entities and separate legal persons, they have to pay income tax on their profits, which results in a bizarre form of double taxation because the corporation that you own shares in is taxed, and then when you receive dividends of the already taxed money, you have to pay income tax on that, and if you, you know, sell and buy and, tr buy and sell and trade shares and make a profit on the, s the selling, you have to pay a capital gains tax. So it's really not an advantage um, in that regard. Um, and it's really not a privilege because you could easily accomplish this without the state uh, just by using a common name to file lawsuits and to let people sue you. It's actually a convenience for the benefit of people that you're harming or that you owe money to. It's easier for them to sue the corporation instead of uh, a bunch of individual owners of this select group of, of uh of capital that the corporation owns by virtue of the corporate charter. Um, and as Robert Hessen uh, writes, uh, the entity concept serves no valid purpose like the idea that corporations are creatures of the state. It is a vestige of the medieval mentality and should be uh, discarded. Now perpetual duration is easy to discard with as well. It, uh, critics are just wrong that this is a privilege created by the state. You can easily create perpetual duration by means of clever or careful contract drafting, just like restrictive covenants in neighborhoods, for example. You know, homeowners agree to restrictions on the use of their houses, and this can last forever. And it doesn't matter who moves in and out because the agreement affects the property. So perpetual duration is not an issue either. Um, to make sure I have time, I'm gonna dispense with these really quickly, but look, separation of ownership and control, people have the right to do what they want with their money. If you wanna let someone manage your money, then the manager's good at managing, but he doesn't have a lot of money to manage, you have money, but you're not a good manager. There's nothing wrong with the division of labor. That's all that happens. 
and the free market people should be able to do what they want with their money. As for unaccountable CEOs, you know, you can't take pity in investors. They have the right to invest in a company or not. They can investigate it. If they don't like what's going on, they can sell their shares. There's always a threat of hostile takeovers. If a company's poorly run, they throw out the management. So this is really a non-problem, especially for the libertarian. Um, I've already gone through the origins of limited liability, which is the, really the key issue that people object to. Um, what happened was, as I mentioned, you had originally you had general liability for partners or partnerships. Uh, as capitalism started developing, uh, say in the 1800s, then partnerships started trying to draft in their agreements contractual limited liability, saying, look, I don't want to be liable for everything the partnership does. And American judges kept rejecting this because they, they were not, uh, they, were, they were still making the assumptions that was the case in you know, medieval Italy. So finally the state legislatures bowed to pressure and passed statutes allowing incorporation and limited liability and also limited partnerships, which is a form of limited liability. So this is how it arose, and this is why some people now think that this is a state privilege, because the state had to step in and undercut the decisions of its own judges to allow people to do something contractually as they wanted. Now, there's two parts to this. The first part is fairly easy to dispatch. The second is the real nub of the issue. So there's two types of liability that the corporation can have and that the, the shareholder could potentially face if they don't have limited liability. That's contractual liability, like a debt to a bank, right? Or liability for a tort, that is some harm done to a third, to a third person. So the first one, if you understand enough about contract law and property rights and have libertarian principles, it's really hard to argue that the limited liability grant for contract contractual debt is a problem or is a privilege because it could obviously easily be arranged in a free market without the state's help. Because if you announce to the world this is you know, Pepsi, Inc., you're telling anyone who does deals with you, a vendor, a customer, uh, a lender, a creditor, a bank, uh, a bondholder, you're telling them if, if, if you have to sue us to recover money that we owe you by this contract, then you can only pursue this defined set of assets, but you can't sue these shareholders directly. If they agree to that, that's fine. This is similar to what's known in the law as non-recourse mortgages, which Doug French has written on in his book, Walk Away, where you have a house and you take a loan out on it. The bank agrees to only pursue the value of the house, so if the house gets underwater, you can just walk away. And the bank can take the house and foreclose on it, and they only get what the house is worth, but they might not get the, the, the contract back, but you're not even a breach of contract because the bank agreed to that. Okay? And in fact, in small companies, Quite often, the creditor knows that they don't have a lot of assets, so they'll either insist the bank has a large uh, insurance provision or has a lot of assets, or makes the founder guarantee the loan, you know, makes him co-sign co the loan. So this is all arm's length negotiations. Big boys take risks when they deal with people, they know what they can pursue. Uh, contractual limited liability is no problem, in my view. So let's take the, the nub of the issue. This is really what uh, is, the, is, is the, the main argument, the main objection to corporations, at least by uh, libertarians. So you have, Fe let's take Federal Express. FedEx, FedEx truck injures a person. The driver's negligent, harms someone. Okay, now first of all, people sometimes believe that limited liability means the driver is, 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 uh, is uh, invulnerable for lawsuit. It's not true. Only shareholders are protected by this, by this uh, status. Um, so the, the victim sues the corporation and the truck driver, but if the corporation somehow has insufficient assets, which is extremely unlikely because FedEx is a large corporation with insurance policies and uh, lots of assets, then he, he can't sue the shareholders. Okay? They're not personally liable under limited liability. Now, why should this be the case? Now, unlike the case of contractual debts, we can't justify this this situation by saying, well, there's a contract. The, the victim didn't agree to anything before getting hurt. He didn't you know, know he's dealing with a, uh, a corporation and agree to take his, his risks. So you can't justify limited liability based upon the contract theory. I agree with that, okay? So this is the heart of the opposition, okay? That there shouldn't be limited liability for tort damages, okay? Their argument is that limited liability short circuits the liability that shareholders would otherwise have, and it would make shareholders less responsible for who they elect on the board of directors. You know, I don't really care who I elect because I'm not liable. Uh, that lets the firm have lower costs and externalizes costs, makes them giant 
gives rise to hierarchies and authoritarianism and horrors of horror capitalism. Okay? Now, this argument, if you think about it, rests on an unstated assumption. The, the assumption is that shareholders in a free market would and should be liable for, the, for these types of uh, uh, situations without the state, and therefore, when the state grants them limited liability, it's giving them a, a defense or a privilege they wouldn't otherwise have. But to make that argument, you have to, set, you have to come up with a reason why shareholders should be liable. Now, what's their argument? Because in libertarianism, what's our fundamental principle? People are responsible for their own torts. I'm not responsible for what you do because I didn't do it, right? So the FedEx truck driver is, we all agree, liable. What about the corporation assets itself? Let's put that to the side, but we can even agree that the corporation should be liable because it's hiring and directing his actions, okay? But basically, this is a case of what we call in the law secondary liability or vicarious liability or responsibility. It means I am responsible for what you did. If I co-sign a loan for you, I am secondarily liable for that contractual debt because I co-signed, right? If I order you to go kill someone, then you know, you're a hit man, you're guilty under the criminal law, and I think I should be too because I'm causally responsible for that. I'm ordering your actions, right? Co-conspirators in a crime should all be liable for what each one does. You know, if three guys rob a bank and one of them shoots a teller, um, the other guys are fully liable, jointly and separately liable for the debt. No problem with that under libertarianism. But you have to have a reason. You have to have a reason to attribute responsibility to someone. So what's, what's the reason why the, the employer in general is considered to be liable vicariously for the torts of its employees? It's based upon a theory called respondeat superior. That means it's, it's, uh, the, the master should be liable for the acts of his servants or slaves. So you can see this whole idea is rooted in the kind of ancient medieval feudalistic notion um, uh, where you have masters and servants, et cetera. Now, it, this actually has been re rejected by the leading libertarian scholars who, who've looked into this issue. Murray Rothbard himself, uh, Roger Pallon, and uh, Robert Hessen in his, in his classic book, In Defense of the Corporation. As Roger Pallon writes, respondeat superior, the doctrine, has always been easier to live with than to justify. Okay? So even if we agree, because this is not too controversial, that like the owner, the actual owner of a small company who hires someone and supervises him on a daily basis. Even if we agree, well, you're closely connected enough with the actions of this employee. You know, you told him to go deliver that package, or maybe you didn't have the trucks maintained so they're not safe, or maybe you didn't give the employee enough training. You're closely enough connected to the actions of that person where maybe it's fair to attribute to the owner, the guy who controls and supervises the employee, to attribute to him secondary liability. Okay, vicarious responsibility, okay? Now, but the, the question is, as I mentioned earlier in the example about the shareholder of Google not being able to use their headquarters or the FedEx shareholder not being able to drive a FedEx truck, the owners, quote, owners of a corporation aren't owners in the sense that uh, someone is an owner of a car who can use their car as they wish. Shareholders are what we call passive. They have the roles that I mentioned earlier. They can vote for the directors, and they receive dividends and winding up. That's basically what they do. Um, some of them, when they buy shares, contribute money to the corporation. Okay? They don't all do this, which is another fact uh, admitted by critics of the, of, of, uh, of, of the limited liability theory. So uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is this is the, the facts or the features that critics of limited liability point to. They say that shareholders are owners, and therefore they should be responsible. Well, this is just false. Ownership doesn't imply responsibility. Ownership is the right to use something. It doesn't imply responsibility. Libertarians believe that we're responsible for our actions, not for ownership. And I'll just give a couple of examples. You know, if Smith & Wesson sells someone a gun and later it's used to commit murder, Smith & Wesson should not be liable for what's done. They didn't direct the guy to do that. Uh, if Avis rents me a car and I have a wreck, Avis, in my opinion, should not be responsible just because I used their property. It was my action, not theirs. Uh, if someone steals my knife and they stab someone and kill them with it, I shouldn't be liable for murder. It was my knife that was used to kill the person, but it wasn't my action. I still own the knife. So it's this kind of bizarre, unjustified theory of strict liability, which it just assumes that ownership of property gives you obligations. It doesn't. It gives you rights. It gives you the right to exclude others and the right to use a resource and that's it. OK? 
Okay? Some people analogize this to the aiding and abetting idea. Like if you, if you, uh, if you uh, plan a bank robbery or you are sitting outside the bank in a getaway car waiting for the robbers to come outside, that you're held to be causally responsible and jointly liable with all the bank robbers because you were aiding and abetting. And I agree, that should be um, a crime. And you should be responsible. Okay? And the idea is that shareholders are these evil guys that are aiding and abetting some evil corporation by doing what? By electing board members on the board? Well, they don't all vote, and sometimes they vote for the guy that loses, right? And you're not usually voting for someone who's running on a platform that they're going to cause the BP oil spill, right? Um, or is it because I gave money to the corporation by buying shares? Well, what does this mean? If, if, you, if, you, if you buy a, a Big Mac from McDonald's, you're giving them money, you're a customer. Does that mean you're aiding and abetting any torts that McDonald's commits? And in fact, shareholders don't always give money to the corporation. If I buy shares from an existing shareholder, I'm just trading it with him. I never gave a dime to the company that I bought shares from. Okay? Lots of actors that interact with a corporation uh, aid and abet it, in a sense. Vendors, people that give it supplies, every employee in the company, um, the unions, creditors and lenders, bondholders, um, and customers. If we're going to have a theory of causal responsibility and joint liability and vicarious liability that we have such a low threshold that we can say that just because you're a shareholder, a passive shareholder has no direct control over the actions of employees, then we would have a threshold so low that it would ensnare literally tens or hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of people that have any connection with the corporation. If shareholders are liable, customers are liable, vendors and suppliers are liable, creditors and lenders, banks and bondholders, all these people are potentially liable, which is, I think I don't have to argue that this is obviously absurd. So, in conclusion, I would say we do need to get the state out of the business of building roads, regulating marriage, chartering corporations, but I wouldn't expect roads, marriage, or corporations to, dis to disappear in the free society. Thank you. <laughs>